Hello. Well, we're back a little sooner than I think we thought we were going to be. I think I just think, I think I said I thought, I think. Um, Pete DeBoer has been fired. No replacement has been named. Obviously, we are going down to go down the path of who should be said replacement, who is likely to be said replacement. All of that good stuff, we will see what will happen. But I want to start with the actual decision in it of itself, what it says, what it means, what they said about it, where we're headed, all of it. Um, step one, beyond any of it, is that I want to make it abundantly clear before I go into some of the deeper issues that go beyond what the decision was, that I do think it was fair that Pete DeBoer was relieved of his duties as head coach today. I, I do think there were enough issues over the course of the past three seasons to where you can say, I'm not sure this is the guy that would actually have gotten us over the hump moving forward with the roster that we're likely to bring back, or at least any version of the roster that we are likely to bring back. I think we would have run into similar road, road speed bumps, road hops, I don't whatever you want to call them down the road. And I'm just not sure that the style of play with the group that is in the front office with the players were ever going to be able to win four consecutive playoff series just seemed unlikely to me. So with that being said, it's not the end of the world roadblocks. Yeah, good job. Yeah. It's not like a decision that I find stunning or a decision that I'm going to like completely lambast or anything of that sort based solely on the fact that I don't think they had their Stanley Cup winning coach in Pete DeBoer. I think Pete DeBoer is a great coach. I think Pete DeBoer can win a Stanley Cup. I'm not saying that Pete DeBoer is not a Stanley Cup winning coach. I'm saying with this team in this set setup and in this situation, I think there would have had to have been a full rebuild before they could have built a team that Pete would have been able to get through 16 wins. That's kind of what I want to start with. So in that regard... I do in some ways celebrate the decision to make a move that is somewhat risky and somewhat dangerous in this particular case to say, we need a different option. We need to change some things. We're going to put ourselves in a different place and hopefully a better place moving into next season when I think the seats are going to be hot on everybody else that's made these decisions outside of the guy whose seat can't get hot and that's Foley. But I do want to make an important, an important distinction in that this season, throughout the course of the season, and what had happened over all of this season, and McCrimmon made this clear that he didn't want to put it this way, but we are all going to look at it this way. He was the last to be deserving of getting fired based on this season. Like, Pete dragged a team that was not very good to within three points of making the playoffs. And then who knows what may have happened at that point. I think if they play Edmonton or LA, they win the series. I think if they play anybody else, they probably do not. So he was putting them in a position that I think they were better off than where they would have been before or would have been with somebody else, right? Maybe not would have been before, because I do think Gallant could have potentially won a cup with this group, which is a huge distinction. And I'll get to him down the road. But like, I'm not 100% sure that he deserved any part of the blame in what happened because he's the only reason, and that's probably a little strong, but he's a big reason why they were as close as they were. But the warts that we saw were things that were going to inevitably keep them from winning the cup. So that's the part where I, I see it both ways. And I want to make sure we're being clear in the fact of, what comes next probably doesn't solve the problem no matter what it is. They can hire the greatest coach in the world. And unless there's a change in how they're going about building the team and how they're going about attempting to make things work and how they're going to go about what's going to happen with that coach once he is in place, 
I don't know that we're in a position where it's all going to be solved. It may be better. It may put them in a different place. Maybe I'm wrong. We will see. So at least in that regard, I will definitely say I am happy that we are not rolling out the same group that went through this season. I thought that was worst case scenario. I have to say I am happy that that's not happening. I'm not sure they went the right direction or far enough or any of that, but I'm happy that we're headed in that direction. I can confidently say I think the Golden Knights have a better chance to win the Stanley Cup right now, even without a coach, than they did with who they had in place, with what they had in place. That doesn't mean that's all Pete DeBoer's fault. It's definitely not. All right. If you want to read my little thread on that, please go ahead and do so. I think I probably put it a little bit better in writing than I tried to do there. But let's move to who and why and how and how all of this came about. I'll start with this. I do not believe for a second that the Golden Knights fired their head coach without any idea of who they wanted next. I don't believe that. I don't buy that. That's what was said. I do not think that that's accurate. I do not think that that would be a good management style if that were to be the case. I just don't buy it. So if that's the case, I think they've already made a mistake in that regard. But I don't think that's the case. So I'm not going to go on and say, like, they've fucked up here. No, because I don't think that's what actually happened. And that's where it is tricky that we get these press conferences where we're supposed to take a lot of what's being said and – say that this is what they believe and this is what they're saying. And then we have to pick pieces out of it and say, I think that was a blatant lie. And history tells us that it's certainly possible that it was. That's the challenge that we have to get through. And that's, I think that's with a lot of, a lot of front offices, a lot of coaches, a lot of what we do. It is what it is. I wish it were not that case, but here we are. So, I do think the Golden Knights have a plan in place. I do personally believe at this moment that plan is Barry Trotz. I'm not sure that that's actually going to come true. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure that he actually wants to coach next season. I don't know how far they've gotten in the discussions. But when I hear Elliot Friedman going immediately and saying he's heard these discussions already or people chattering about it, when you think of kind of what direction this team would most likely head, what type of move would make the splash that would maybe make Foley happy about it, you know, all of those things. I think that's probably the most likely scenario that we're headed in. So that leads me down to what does that look like? And will that work? On face value, I think Barry Trotz is one of the better coaches in the NHL, if not the best. I don't know that I would go all that far that far because I think Tampa's uh, got a pretty damn good one himself. I really like Rod Brindamore. You know, there are other good ones out there, but I do think Barry Trotz is in the upper echelon of head coaches. I can make the argument he is better than Pete DeBoer. However, his system is very similar to what Pete DeBoer runs. It is a similar idea defensively. They want to take away high danger chances and they want to do it with safe exits. I don't think the defense is going to change all that much, at least not right away, if that's the decision that they end up making. And then it comes down to, okay, well, if that improves a little bit, how much does the offense improve? And the way that Pete or that Trotz runs what he runs, I don't think it's going to improve all that much. I think they're going to have to just get better play out of their players. And so we will see. Uh, yeah, I, I see this question on uh, on Foley and, and that, and I'll answer that down the road here. Actually, I'll do that next. But I like the idea of being a little bit more selective in the offensive zone. I like the idea of quality over quantity. That's kind of something that Trotz looks for. I like the fact that I think Trotz would be a little bit more of a, of a guy that's going to be a little bit closer to his players. I think his voice is a new voice. I think it's going to be a commanding voice. I do think there are good things. I think it would be an upgrade. I'm not 100% sure or anywhere close to say that I think that that's going to fix where they are. And I don't know that when players talk about we need to be a four-line team, we need to play with this type of intensity, all these different things, I think Trotz will insert some of that. But I think at the same time, a lot of what they were talking about is they need to be a little bit more free of a team. They need to be a little bit less structured. And they need to have a little bit more fight in their game. 
Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily what trots would bring. We've seen it with different trots teams. They do go into periods where they cannot score. And the system is a huge part of that. I think you need elite talent, ridiculously elite talent, or a ridiculously good fit to fit Barry Trotz's system. I think Barry Trotz would be better. I think Barry Trotz would bring this team to the playoffs. I think Barry Trotz could win playoff rounds with this team. I'm not sure that with the roster that they currently have, that he would be the difference because I don't see him as a drastic change off of Pete DeBoer, which is possibly what this team needs if they're going to head back in the right direction. As far as the question that was asked, watching the, this is Brennan, watching the presser, seems like Kelly phrased the firing around the decision of Foley. Do you think Foley pulled the trigger or McPhee and McCrimmon? So there's three different pieces of this that I find interesting that I'm probably going to write an article about in the coming days about how this went down and who's actually running the show and what, what actually happened here. You have the first thing, which is, Bill Foley saying he thinks the team lost its identity. He's going to be more vocal. He's got some ideas. That's the plan. That's the way that they're going. That's number one. You then have before the press conference, uh, Eric Duhatchek from The Athletic wrote an article saying he has sources telling him that Foley was very involved and that this was a Foley decision, that Foley was a big part of why Pete DeBoer is no longer with this team. And then you have McCrimmon, who multiple times, at least twice off the top of my head that I can remember, flat out said, we made the decision, we being him and McPhee, and they brought it to Foley and Foley signed off on it, which indicates that it is backwards from what the previous two potential options looked like. I believe it is somewhat of both. I think Foley wanted a change. I think Foley wanted something new. I think Foley believed, like a lot of us believe, and like I believe, that you cannot roll everything back the same way it was and expect that just the injuries will fix everything. We have to fix something else and change the fact that we do not have much of an identity at this moment. How are we going to go about doing that? I think in the process of all of that, it became clear that the best case scenario for the front office to not have their problem you know, not have their asses on the line would be to go down the road of getting rid of DeBoer. I think that's probably how it went down. I don't have any information on that. I'm just reading between the lines here. I think they said, you know what? He's going to want change. It's probably us or, the, us or him or one of us or him or however it happens to be. I don't think that the trio of McPhee, McCrimmon, and DeBoer could have all come back and fully been okay with it or at least been okay with it long enough that they could have gone through any stretch of a rough patch without someone else getting fired. And that that could have been on some the people that did not get fired had they not made the decision earlier. That's how I read it. Again, I do not have any information about that behind the scenes or any of that. I'm just reading what I've seen. That's how I believe it goes. Then I also think if you're going to go to Foley with the idea that we are going to fire Pete DeBoer, I don't think you do it without a plan B behind it. What is the plan that we're going to do behind it? I think they have that plan. I, again, would argue I think that plan is Barry Trotz. I think Foley would go for that. I think that's where we're at. But there are other names on the board, uh, a lot of which I'm seeing a lot of people over here commenting on. Here is one of them, Rick Tockett. Rick Tockett, formerly of the uh, – Arizona Coyotes. He also was a coach with the Penguins for a little while there. Uh, currently with TNT, you've probably seen him. I don't like the goatee. I wish he didn't have the goatee. It's too perfectly trimmed and then the bald and then the perfectly trimmed. And it looks, I just feel like his mouth looks weird and I don't like it. And this is from somebody who I actually feel like I can comment on the fashion of balding people that can grow facial hair. So I don't like that look, but I think that's fixable. I think he could fix that pretty quickly, and I would hope that he does fix that quickly if that's the plan. I do think that that Rick Tockett is a legitimate option. I like a lot of what Rick Tockett would bring. Uh, just a quick look on on kind of some of the information of that's out there on what Rick Tockett systems were, what they would be, what he has learned. I think all of that, how he deals with players. Tockett system involves a lot of movement. Tockett system involves a lot of free-flowing play, creativity, allow the players to do the right things. A lot of it does remind me a little bit of the way Gallant goes. And then I also think he would be a little bit more of that player's coach that will kind of shield the callousness of the front office 
from the players, which I think they do need in place once again. They just probably need a better working relationship between the head coach and the and the front office than they had with Gallant, as that was shown as he was shown the door awfully quickly. Tockett could potentially be that guy. Rick Tockett does live in Las Vegas. Uh, he, you know, he, he he has been here for a while. I don't think that means anything other than the fact that I would imagine that proximity would lead down at least a call. I think he will at least get a call. There are fits there that I do like about Rick Tockett. My concern about Rick Tockett is he's been in the playoffs one time in five seasons and he didn't do well when he got there. Most of his teams flamed out pretty quickly, weren't very good in the regular season. I understand that it was Arizona, that he didn't have nearly as much talent as what he had now. But you have a team that had a ton of talent, that had a coach that is constantly in the playoffs, that missed the playoffs. And now you're bringing in a coach that has not had a ton of playoff success, and we don't know what it would look like there. And you're hoping that he will, to use Pete DeBoer's term, press the right buttons come playoff time. I'm not sure you have that in Rick Tockett because we don't have a lot of a lot of time showing what exactly that would look like and evidence to say that that would work. Uh, other names that are out there, Paul Maurice is one that obviously jumps to the front of the, of the you know, because he's one of the better guys. I think that's awfully unlikely based on the fact that he's one of well, one of his best friends is Pete DeBoer. I can't imagine that there's a lot of great information coming from Pete DeBoer to Paul Maurice to say, go and take that job after Paul Maurice basically said he lost his love for coaching, which is why he effectively quit uh, in Winnipeg. I don't think that's suddenly going to come back dealing with all of the pressure and stress and some of the, the shenanigans in many ways that you have to deal with dealing with a team that pushes up against the cap and plays the game the way that this team plays it. I don't see that actually being likely, but I do think that would be a good fit if he suddenly regained his love for coaching and wanted to put himself back in a position to, to, to get there. I don't like the idea of Rick bonus at all. I don't think Rick bonus is a high level coach. Uh, I think he's a good coach, but he's not a massively over the top coach. I don't think that he makes a big change. I think it's a step down against DeBoer. I think they would also play a defensive system that would be similar to what we've seen out of Dallas. I don't like that idea because I don't think that's going to generate much offensively there. Um, Tortorella, Babcock, I don't love either. I don't think that's what the team needs either. Is is kind of a you you know authoritarian? That's the word I'm trying to say. Don't think that's a good option. Wouldn't shock me if they brought in uh, either for an interview. Uh, I would lean more towards Babcock than Tortorella. I also think that there's a history of Tortorella with one of the crucial players on the team. If they were to go down the Tortorella plan, I think William Carlson has to go immediately. I agree with Nicholas, though. No controversial people would be best. I don't think this team needs any more drama. Bringing in a Torts Ray Babcock would be drama. And then there is the last name. Let me see if someone said it. There we go. Quenville. This is a bad idea. Joel Quenville is the best coach available. That is not even debatable. There is not a better head coach on the market without a job as a head coach than Joel Quenville. However... Joel Quenville is currently not allowed to coach in the league. They would actually have to file a plan or something to the NHL asking for him to come back. There is good reason for that. If you do not know the reasons of why Joel Quenville was fired or released or whatever you want to call it from Florida and why he is currently not with having a job despite being without question the best coach available, look it up. Type in Joel Quenville's name into Google. Type in... A whole, Kyle Beach is a good name to put next to it. Do any of that, and you will quickly realize that the Golden Knights should not hire Joel Quenville, period. I believe, like Chris says here, it would end my fandom of the Golden Knights immediately. I think a lot of people would be in that position. I believe that most people should be in that position. Time will possibly heal that wound. I think there is possibly an opportunity for Joel Quenville to come out and admit a lot of the mistakes that he has made in the past. I have not seen enough of that at this point. I do not think enough time has elapsed at this point either. I do not think they should hire Joel Quenville. I think that would be an absolute mistake, a bad move by the Golden Knights, and I think it's a PR disaster that they do not need. All right, that's as clear and strong as I can be on Joel Quenville.
Uh, moving on, let's see. Qualities I want to see in a new head coach. Um, the first thing that I think is the most important thing for this team is I think they actually need to find a way to take advantage of all of the best things that these players do, which is part of why I actually don't really want a system coach coming in. Now, I've mentioned all that I mentioned before about Trotz. It is what it is. I think he's good enough that he can potentially overcome some of the things that I'm about to say. I don't think Trotz is a fit for a lot of the things that I'm about to say. However, I think he's such a good coach that it might end up working out anyway. So keep that in the back of your mind. But the first thing is, I think you want a guy who's going to allow them to just play. The Golden Knights have a lot of talent. The Golden Knights have good players in every single section of their roster. They don't have to be told exactly how to play. They're not a team that has to come out and do the tactics better than the other team to beat them. Now, come playoff time, we are going to probably have to get a little bit more tactical and find holes in who we're playing and whatever. And I think most, if not all, qualified NHL coaches can do that down the road. But in the regular season, and the main part that this team needs to do to get back to is playing a style that is enjoyable, playing a style that makes you love the game of hockey again, as opposed to thinking that of what's going on all the time, constantly thinking, I need to do this to fall inside of what we're trying to accomplish as a team. I'm not trying to say we need more individual play or any of that. I think they need to be a little bit more free. They need to be a little bit more creative. They need to be a little bit more risky and not be afraid of the possibility of what's coming back on them and the mistakes that could potentially come back on them. It's going to take a coach that has some massive balls to do that because you're going to walk in here and there's immediately going to be Stanley Cup content, you know, Stanley Cup uh, aspirations on the board. That's going to be the idea. That's what everyone's going to want. And yet, I think the coach has to come in and say things like, you can make mistakes. You have to be able to make the mistakes. That if we're not being free, being fun, having a team that's going to use the talent that we all have and play together in a way that is fun and hard to play against, you're going to fuck up a lot. And we have a good goalie back there. We have good skating defensemen back there. We're just going to have to get bailed out. And if they don't, it is what it is. We'll go score another one afterwards and deal with it. Not that big a deal. And if we lose today, so be it. But to get us to a point where we're going to play at our absolute peak, that's what we have to do. That's probably the number one quality that I'm looking for in the coach. Second thing, I'd love to see some sort of power play change where there is movement and they're utilizing multiple options and they have a lot of different things that they're trying to go to, that there's a plan A and a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. And it's very clear. And all of these options come to play and they're scoring goals a bunch of different ways. I think that's a huge part of what the coach needs to do. Uh, and the last thing, as I said a little bit earlier, I think it's going to have to be a player's coach. I don't think that they can go down a road of anyone that seems to make more sense down the road of look at how business-like and callous this particular guy can be. They need someone who's going to go to bat for their players, that's going to fight against their front office for the players, and be fully on the side of the players. That has to come back. And I think that would also lead to somebody being on the side of the fans. Uh, I think that's kind of how those go hand in hand, in my opinion, usually. I think they have to go down that road. Trotz does fill that box. Tockett does fill that box. Tortorella, Babcock do not fill that box. We'll see what they decide. Uh, somebody asked about a first-time head coach possibility. I think the Golden Knights are highly unlikely to go down that road. I do not think there are any head coaches that will even get an opportunity to even come close to getting this job that have not coached at least three, four, five seasons in the NHL. I think Tockett might be the least uh, experienced coach that has a legitimate shot of getting this job. However, I did a quick research and there are two guys that I would love to see. One of them, his name is Ricard Gronberg. He is Swedish. Uh, he has coached the Swedish international team for years and years. You've probably seen his face if you've watched any of World Junior or IIHF. He's basically been the face of Sweden head coaching for a long time. Uh, he currently coaches in Switzerland. His teams are usually very good. He is essentially a like... Ted Lasso's too strong uh, of a term, but he's kind of the 
guy who cares a lot more about relationships with his players and with the organization than he does tactics and style and what's going on there. I think that would be a massive change in direction. I think he would be absolutely fantastic. I think he's going to be good whenever he eventually gets over here. And I think it's going to open doors for getting Swedish free agents, which would be nice. And also, I think it would probably put them in a position where one of their best players who underperformed this season, who is Swedish, might even play better. I like the idea of that a lot. I do not think that's horribly likely. The other one's Cam Abbott. Uh, Cam Abbott's a Canadian guy uh, who played, I believe, uh, I think he played uh, NCAA hockey. Either way, Canadian guy been dealing, uh, been coaching in the Swedish league. His brother is the GM of the same team. I believe it's pronounced Rugla or Rugel, something like that. Uh, for the Swedish league, when he took over, they were terrible. They won the league this year in the regular season. Crashed out in the playoffs a little bit. But I think he and his brother, uh, they're very good at finding good players. They're very good at bringing young players up. Nils Hoaglander, Moritz Sider are a couple of names that come to, to uh, mind right there. That's, what we're saying. That, that, that's another option. Again, don't think that's horribly likely. I also would like them to possibly look down the road of going with a female assistant. Uh, I think it's time that we start going down that road. I think if you look at all of the different female options that are out there in the game of hockey, a lot of them know hockey as well, if not better, than a lot of the men that have been retreads around this league. I think there's an opportunity right here for the Golden Knights to go down that road, take a leap, Hopefully they pick the right person. Doesn't always work that easily, but I think that's something they could potentially look at. I also think that would bring a different dynamic to the team. It'll bring a different PR spin to the team. I think that's something that they could actually use and would be a good idea. There are a bunch of names out there. I don't want to put any names particular out there because there are so many of them and I don't know enough about all of them because of the fact that I haven't done enough research because I found out at nine o'clock this morning that they needed a new head coach and I wasn't thinking about that. But I do think that would be something that would help the organization as a whole. It's a different type of voice. I think a lot of it would be smart. I think that would be a great idea and something that they should absolutely consider. Uh, and it's, we'll see. I don't expect that to happen either because I expect them to go full retread. Uh, I think the most likely thing they're going to do is go down retread. Yeah, McCrimmon said he, I don't think it's going to be a head coach uh, flat out. I, I just don't think we're at the point in the world of hockey that we have someone who is qualified enough based solely on the fact that we're not far enough along where we probably should be, but we aren't far enough along at the moment that someone actually is in a position to step in and take this job at this moment with this team. I just don't think we're there. That doesn't mean that that shouldn't be a plan moving forward. Eventually, I think everyone's going to have to take the steps. We're just not there yet. I don't think we're at a point where we can have uh, a female head coach, but I do think that it's something that they should look at down the road, or at least now for going down uh, uh, a assistant coach. Uh, someone asked on the, on Twitter about a new, new job for Pete. We'll be interested to see what he does. He had one year left on his contract somewhere in the ballpark of 3 million. Uh, he was fired and then quickly took the job last time, went through pandemic filled seasons uh, has not had a lot of time, I would assume, to his family over the course of the past three years or two and a half or however long you want to look at it. I would be surprised if he took another job based solely on the fact that I don't think he should. I think if you're in a position that that you can take a year off and, and, and kind of learn from some of the things that have happened, I think Gallant showed in many ways that that can be a good idea as he's doing it. I think it would be smart for him not to take a job. I do believe he will be given multiple opportunities. I think if he wants a job, he will take a job uh, and will get a job quickly. I think it may be one of the openings currently. It wouldn't shock me if another opening comes up. Somebody mentioned Seattle. I don't think it's going to be Seattle. They're going to need a new coach eventually, but I don't think they're at the point that they need one now. Uh, by the way, this Periscope and all Periscopes are brought to you by Conlear and Associates CPAs. It looks like we're not even going to have a full summer of doing, you know, we are going to have a full summer of doing these because we're going to need a new coach and then there's going to be free agency and the draft and all that good stuff. And Conlear and Associates CPAs should be with us through all of it. 
We have proved we love that they've been with us for as long as they have, and we hope that you support them as they have supported me and Jason and Sinbin. We definitely appreciate uh, their support. ConlarCPA.com. If you need any tax help, obviously tax day has passed, but that doesn't mean you can't get a jump on your taxes for next year. Trust me, if you don't own a small business, it's a great idea to get your taxes in line before tax day because it's a hell of a lot easier when tax day comes up. Because if you're me and like three years ago before I knew Conler and Associates CPAs and Gary, uh, it wasn't fun. And now it's not nearly as bad and I don't dread the fact that the calendar turns over and I have to deal with it. What are my thoughts on Mark Stone? Um, so if you didn't hear, the news is Mark Stone is getting back surgery on Wednesday. That is two days from now. Very likely they said that he's getting back surgery. Here's the thing that I find very odd about that. And, and I don't know if it's concerning yet. I'm not sure. I, I intend on talking to... Uh, Dr. Penninger down the road, and we'll we'll broadcast that at some point, getting more information about this. But the injury seems to date back pretty far. Um, he flat out denied it in the Montreal series, but he wasn't very good in that series. He was pretty good in the in the Colorado series right before. It certainly at least dates back to game two of this season, which was early October or mid-October. In and out of the lineup, willing to do, you know, all-star game and those different things. They went through the whole process at the beginning of the year, trying to figure out what was wrong with him, what, what needs to happen. And all of that, through all of that, when he came back, he said it was a frustrating process. Nobody could quite put, the, put their finger on it, but he felt stronger than he'd ever felt before. And he thought that his new normal, he had, he had kind of tricked himself into being in a new normal and that he felt better at that moment. So in many ways, it appeared that rest was what was going to fix that. But then immediately as it broke down again, and then he's out again for, for the extended period of time. And, you know, we can kind of, play around with the dates a little bit, understanding that they needed his nine and a half million on long-term IR. I would probably play around with those dates a little bit because I don't think that in a world in which they had no cap constraints at all, that the season would have gone exactly as it did for Mark Stone. I just, I, I truly do believe that, but I can say that once he did come back and that was months later, he wasn't the same player by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think he was even close to what we need him to be if he's going to be a $9.5 million player and making a huge impact on this team. I just don't know what they're going to do here. And to think that he didn't need surgery all of this time, that then he comes back, he plays, he goes into postseason uh, availability and says something along the lines of, you don't want to have a surgery just to have it, which led me to believe he's probably going to try to not have a surgery because there hasn't been a surgery that's been pitched to him that makes clear sense to fix it to now two weeks later, it seems likely he's going to have it, but we're still having discussions about whether or not that's going to happen on Monday when he's possibly having this surgery on Wednesday. Let's put it this way. It certainly does not seem as cut and dry as the artificial disc replacement that Jack Eichel got. He was really confident about that. He knew that that was going to help. He came back. That did help. I'm not sure what to make of this one. It's highly concerning whether or not he's ever going to be the player he was before. We are going to have to wait and see if that's the case. This is going to be a prove it type of situation. However, I can't in good faith or at all decide whether I think he should have surgery or not have surgery because I think either way, I'm going to have the same concerns. Leave it to the doctors to do the right thing. I feel like this belief of like, it's definitely a good thing, which is what Kelly McCrimmon said. I'm not sure I can go there, at least based on the information I had. You want to give more information like Jack Eichel was doing the entire time. Maybe we'll have a little bit better of a picture here. But for me, surgery, no surgery. It's going to be whenever he's ready to come back, there's going to be heavy scrutiny on his play. There's going to be a lot of wondering 
are we getting peak Mark Stone? And I think we're going to have to remind ourselves of what peak Mark Stone was so we don't try to fool ourselves into thinking that the last 10 games that we just got are anything close to peak Mark Stone. Uh, What else did I have on here? Uh, When to hire a new head coach is another one that I had on there. A number of people were asking that. Kelly McCrimmon was asked about that. It sounded like they are in absolutely no rush. He specifically mentioned that they don't have to do it before free agency. They don't have to do it before the draft or any of that good stuff. I find that odd. I find that to be, I don't want to say fully wrong, but that's not how I would go about it. Uh, I think it shows a little bit of the cards of how this organization believes they want to run it uh, and how they think of the communication or the or the the relationship between head coach and front office you go all the way back five years ago almost six now when Gerard Gallant was hired it was uh slightly before the expansion draft uh 2017 so you're looking at it must have been May or June or something of that sort 2017 uh which we're a ways away from that we're heading on five years now that press conference there was a clear theme of that press conference. And that theme was very clearly, we manage, he coaches. We will tell him who, which players he has, and we are not going to tell him what to do with said players. He is going to take the players that we gave him, not tell us he needs different players or wants different players. He is just going to coach them. We saw multiple issues along the, along the road of what that looked like. Vadim Shipashev didn't fit. They gave him the player. He didn't fit the coach. It ends up having to turn into this forced retirement. Tomas Tatar, they gave him the player. They bought big to give him help. He didn't seem to use that player or think he fit. Didn't really work out. He didn't play all that much in the playoffs. They ended up having to give him away and take a terrible trade on that. I think down the road, we've seen that with different people and different players and the, the kind of that connection was never fully there with Gallant and the front office. Now, with Pete, I thought it was a little better. But at times, it started to kind of crumble. Do I think Jack Eichel fit what Pete DeBoer was looking for? Not really. Uh, do, do I think that Logan Thompson down the road fits the style that Pete DeBoer wanted? Not really. It was better, at least down the road, but it didn't really fit. He was more of a Leonard type guy. He likes that type of player. And that's why I think at times we leaned, we, we saw him lean on Leonard. So the communication in that, and communication is not the right word. It's more relationship. The, the symbiotic relationship between the two, I think needs to be stronger. And you need to have the coach having a little bit more of an input. And I think that the question being asked, uh, I believe Ryan Wallace of the Insider Show asked it, uh, of when do you want to get this done and how important is it to get done in time? Um, it was basically, it doesn't matter. And I think that is further proof that we are managing, he will coach, he or she, I should say. I think it's going to be a male head coach. Uh, he will coach down the road. And so I disagree with that. I think the, the the coach absolutely should be in place. I think the coach should be making decisions on what can I do with an Evgeny Dodonov? What can I do with a lot of these other players down the road? Do I need a Loren Brassois? What do I think of a Robin Leonard? I'd rather that it was a discussion between the guy soon to be running the team and the group managing the team that they're doing it together. I thought that answer really claimed and said, no, it doesn't have to work that way. And it's not going to work that way moving forward. I didn't like that particular op that, 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 that answer. I don't like that style. Uh, I think that is part of what we see moving forward. I don't think a lot changes in that respect. So I do think it could happen in three months. It could happen tomorrow. Uh, if it's trots, I don't think it's going to take that long because I, I would imagine if that's the plan, that's what's going to happen. Again, like I said about DeBoer, I don't know why trots would want to coach next year. I just don't. Like getting paid $5 million to do absolutely nothing, take the year off and then take the best opportunity that comes. Now, there's an argument to be said that if he thinks this is the best opportunity, it's not going to be there next season. If I take the year off, blah, 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 blah. I get it, whatever. Uh, what else do I have? Oh, Ryan Craig. So Steve Spot and Ryan McGill were also uh, fired today. 
I think spot was pretty obvious one. He was always going to go uh, with the boar. I think he caught way too much criticism from the fan base. I don't think he was good or bad. I think he was just part of Pete DeBoer's group. I don't really think he should have been getting any of the wrath at all, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Sometimes we have our scapegoats. He was probably going to go no matter what. If Pete did, he was probably not going to go no matter what if Pete didn't go. He didn't even run the power play down the stretch. So I don't even know what to make of that. But, but the guy who was running the power play was Ryan Craig. Ryan Craig played for the Brandon Wheat Kings. I think he was actually the captain of the Brandon Wheat Kings, if I'm not mistaken. Played in the AHL for a long time. A little bit of NHL experience from what I remember. Immediately went into coaching. Was given that job pretty quickly off of ending his, his career. Was handed to Gerard Gallant. Gerard Gallant did not select either Ryan McGill or Ryan Craig. Gerard Gallant did select Mike Kelly. Those two were fired together. The other two were kept. This time... McGill was let go and Craig was kept. I think it is possible that the front office believes so much in the back end of the season and the power play that if they hand it completely over to Ryan Craig, that it's going to succeed moving forward next season. I'm not sure I agree with that. But again, I need to do a little bit more research on those power plays. An article is coming up. I'm going to go through all of the power plays down the stretch of the last like five, six, seven games and look at how much better actually was it? What was the plan? How much better did it look? All of that, those different things. I think that will give me a little bit better of a sense on Ryan Craig. Personally, I test didn't really tell me that they're way better down the stretch. I know the results were there. I know some big goals were scored in it, but it didn't tell me it was that much better. I don't fully understand how you think you need a fully new voice and that he is going to stay. It's not the end of the world. I don't think it's necessarily a bad decision. If they truly believe that he's in a, in a better space moving forward and that he's going to help this team moving forward, perfectly fine with that. Getting rid of Misha Donskob would have been absolutely stupid. I don't understand any consideration that that was. I didn't even think his name needed to be brought up. Why would you get rid of that guy? He's been awesome as a skills coach. I think a lot of the guys rave about him. There's no reason to get rid of that guy. Absolutely not. That would have been dumb. As far as Craig, if you're going to look at the power play, he was definitely a part of the power play to then keep him. I think it says something about what they think about the power play. We'll see. That's going to be one that, that that one is now kind of linked more towards the front office. I'm not sure why you'd want a, another guy linked towards the front office on the bench that's a little bit of a weird dynamic there especially because you're going to bring in a new head coach who now isn't allowed to have his full complement of assistant coaches then there's the goalie coach Mike Rosati he was a disciple of Dave Pryor was handed the job after Dave Pryor was unceremoniously fired and lied about he gets the job I think it was an impossible position that he was placed in with having Flurry and Leonard. I think it was an impossible situation that he was placed in this season with Leonard being injured the entire year. Somehow, Flurry played a Vezina quality season underneath him. I think it's fair that he deserves another opportunity to potentially keep his job here. We'll see. I don't know which way that's going to go. I think it's going to depend on which head coach comes in. We'll see. I, like I said, I don't know. I don't have a good feel for what goes one way or the other there, but I guess I don't fully understand why is Ryan Craig definitely staying and Mike Rosati has to apply for his job basically again or interview for his job again. I don't fully understand that dynamic. I'd love more information on that. I'm not sure we're going to get it anytime soon. Uh, the last one I have on the list, and if you guys have any other ones you could throw in there. Oh, here's one. Uh, based on the history of Russians, do you think it sours the chance of landing Andre Kuzmenko? I don't. Uh, I think actually think that the history of the Russians has gotten significantly better. Uh, Miramanov, Morozov, Dorofeyev, uh, Marushev, they've all come over. They've all done well in the AHL. They've all been a part of the team, uh, have made some impact at the NHL level for Dorofeyev and uh, um, defenseman that I can't, why can't I think of his name? I just said it two seconds ago. It's bothering me now. Fuck. Whatever. I just said it two minutes ago, and now 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 it's off my head. Miramanov. God damn it. Uh, yeah. So 
he was, he, you know, he played in the NHL. He was pretty darn good, did what he needed to do. It was fine. So I think actually they're in good, they're in a good spot with that. I, I, I think it comes down to whether or not they, uh, Kuzmenko decides he wants to play for this team and we'll see. And then what's the price? Like, I don't think, I think he's old enough that he does not qualify for the entry level system. So I don't think it's a cheap setup. Uh, I think he might actually cost 2 million, two and a half. I'm not sure the Golden Knights have that money. Uh, we'll see what goes down that road. The other question that, that people were asking are, are players that are at risk now that Pete is gone. Um, I don't think it changes much on the player pool at all. Um, obviously, they have to figure out a way to massage their way back under the salary cap of $82.5 million. They're currently sitting at like 83 and a half, and that's without uh, all the uh, unrestricted free agents, which are namely uh, Smith and Yanmark. Uh, it's without having a new contract with Wah, which based on the comps could be 3 million or so not having a new contract in Colazar. I think that one could be pushing where Carrier is at a million and a quarter or something of that sort and not having a new contract on Haig. We'll see where that one goes as well. Didn't play all that much. I don't know. That one could easily be 2 million. That one could easily be less than a million. We'll see. There's a lot that they have to do. Um, I don't think that it would be wise to play the LTIR game again. Um, We'll see. Wouldn't shock me if they do. As far as like who changes? I think the biggest one with Pete going, like the number one above anybody is Leonard. Uh, I don't think that the relationship of Leonard and DeBoer was something that was going to get fixed. Um, I thought one of them had to go and it ends up being DeBoer. So I think that makes Leonard a little bit safer to stick around. I think maybe because of that, that would lead me to say then I guess Brassois would be more likely to go because it would be very foolish to not give Logan Thompson the opportunity. If you watch what he's doing in, in for Team Canada, made a save last night or this morning or whenever it was. Holy shit. It was unbelievable. Diving back across, glove save, arm up. Beautiful. Look at Logan's uh, Instagram if you want to see it. It's on his story. It's fucking gorgeous. Um, You know, I I think it would be stupid to not give him an opportunity. And not only do I think Logan deserves an opportunity to be the backup, I think he actually deserves an opportunity to play upwards of 30 games. And that should be built into whatever you're trying to do anyway. Um, So in that respect, maybe you don't need Leonard. But I I, I think this makes it more likely that they keep Leonard. I don't think they're actually going to be able to find a place to send Leonard. Uh, so I think that's going to stick around as far as the other players. Like, I guess there's an argument to be made that maybe like a William Carlson gets put in a better position because I don't know that he would have certainly recovered uh, under Pete DeBoer. Now with Pete DeBoer out, I think Carlson becomes a little bit safer uh, based on the fact that you don't have to think that he's not going to have a good season. Uh, there's a possibility that he does recover to, to kind of being better and being more of the player that, that they they're paying for. Uh, that's one can't really think of anybody else. I don't think it changes much on Dodonoff. I don't think it changes much on Smith. Yan, Mark, um, Pacioretty is another one that they could, could potentially move if they want to go down the salary uh, dump that way. Don't really have a lot of different options there. Uh, what else we got? If you have any other questions, go ahead and throw them in there. Uh, I'll tell you again, Conler Associate CPAs is the sponsor of this. Please go to conlercpa.com. That's K-O-N-D-L-E-R-C-P-A.com. They are fantastic for all of your tax needs, especially if you are a small business or if you've gotten killed on the cryptocurrency recently, which I have, hasn't been good. We'll be all right. We'll get we'll get back. Bear market. We'll be fine. It'll be bullish again at some point. Not worried. Not worried. Sucks, but it does. I'm not worried. And when I eventually make all those crypto gains, Conler CPA will help us. How likely is this team to keep Dodonoff over Pacioretty? I don't think it's likely, but I do think it's possible. And that is because the price to give up to Donoff was massive. Um, And I don't think the price to give up Pacioretty would be. And if you have a coach that can come in and say, I can get the best out of Donoff, then maybe you would actually go down that road. How likely? I would say it's unlikely. 10%, 15%, something of that sort. Uh, Long shot as a coach, Derek England. I think that's about as long a shot as can possibly be. Uh, I think similarly to what I was saying about females being an op- getting an opportunity to get the head coaching job. I just don't think the qualification is there at the moment. Uh, I just don't think they're qualified right now. I don't think there's a female out there that's qualified to be an NHL coach at the moment. And that's 
probably more of an indictment on hockey itself than anything else. I don't think that's an indictment on Derek England. I don't think that Derek England should go from being on the ice two years ago to not being a coach in the last two years to suddenly being the head coach of the team. I think that would be absolutely ridiculous. Down the road, if Derek wants to be a coach, put him, give him an opportunity potentially with Henderson. Maybe he wants to go and go up to, to the Wheat Kings. I heard they got an in there. Maybe they want to go that road. But at this moment, Derek England is in no way qualified to take over this team. I do not think that would be a good idea at all. I don't think they will even consider it. I don't think it will even come up at all. Uh, that's it. Buyouts if price is too high. Yeah, I'm always going to be against buyouts. Like on every situation, I'm almost always going to be rather willing to sell off the player completely than go down the buyouts. The only time I will ever potentially be okay with a buyout is if you're ready to do a full rebuild. If you know next season we're not going to hit the cap and the season after that we're not going to hit the cap, then I don't mind a buyout for two seasons. But you're talking about two seasons on anybody. And then if it's somebody who has two years, you're talking about four seasons on buying somebody out. I think it's a terrible idea. I always, always, always hate buyouts for a team that's trying to win. Watch what happens to Minnesota next year. Maybe it helped open up things for Minnesota this year. Didn't work. You really sold your soul here and watch what happens. I think it's going to be horrible for the wild moving forward. It's going to make it impossible for them to win a Stanley cup. They might be a decent team. going to be impossible for them to win a Stanley cup. I think it's a bad idea. Uh, who could we bring in to elevate Eichel's play to the max? Or is that player already on the roster? Brisson on the Eichel line. I think they have to try more players that succeed off the puck. Like I, I like Stevenson because Stevenson has the ability to succeed on the puck, but Stevenson's also fairly crafty off the puck. But you have to like what Stevenson does at center, and you lose him at center if you're playing him with Eichel. I think you want to find I don't and, and to be to be completely honest, I'm not sure that guy's on the roster at the moment. I'm trying to think of a player who would really succeed off the puck that can get right to the goal. Like, ooh, look at these uh, spam coming through. Wow. I don't see that that often. How do I mark that in spam? Oh, there we go. Block user. Uh, don't see a lot of spam in the comments. That's 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 fun. Sexychat.ix. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, maybe I'll... Uh, no, I'm not. Um, yeah, like if they can find somebody that can fit that role, I think it would be good. I don't necessarily think there's a player on the roster that's the perfect fit. That being said, there's plenty of different options of players that you can look down. I don't think there's any way Brendan Brisson's going to be ready to be playing 20 minutes a night on the wing of Jack Eichel next season in a cup in a cup contending season. I just don't see that being the case. Uh, Fleury coming back, still a long shot. I think as long as the front office is in place, Mark Andre Fleury will not be a Golden Knight. So uh, as long as and so that's I guess that's as simple as I can put it. Uh, what young guys do you think can come in to contribute? Brisson, Morozov. I think Morozov has the best chance to do it. I think Kuzmenko would actually have a better shot than Morozov. Uh, different player, but Morozov seems to me like the type of player that can come in and be a no uh, be a down the line, down down the lineup type of guy. Step in, do the right thing. I think that is valuable. I would love for Ivan Morozov to be that player and help this team be in a position to make something happen uh, with some entry-level contracts. I don't think he is, though, a massive step in the you know type of guy that's going to be a, a, a game-changer for the Golden Knights. Brisson has more of those qualities, but I don't think Brisson's ready. Uh, having watched a number of the AHL games, I understand the points were there. I understand what was there and what he could bring on the power play. I know. I get it. I think Brisson can score. I think if you plug Brisson in right now, you're going to get Brandon Peary. And I think he can be better than that if you give him more opportunity to develop and to put himself in a place where it's going to fit better. That's kind of how I'm looking at that. Um We'll see. He could very well prove me wrong. Yeah, this one sort of slipped by seemingly everybody. I thought when it happened, the announcement, and the question is, are gold jerseys uh, home jerseys now? When they announced the Circa patch on the jersey, which we retweeted and I sent out the picture and you know we, we talked a little bit about, that same press conference or press release or whatever, I guess there wasn't a conference, the same press release 
announced that the gold jersey is now the home jersey. So this then came out later as like breaking news like three weeks later. And I'm like, what is going on here? I thought we already had that news. That is apparently happening. As far as the other jersey news, I will stand behind the reporting that I have that says that the new retro reverse jersey is red. Uh, I don't I don't have any idea what it looks like. I don't have any other information other than they're going down the road of red again. That would be the retro reverse jersey that will probably be worn a few times. I don't think that's going to be a permanent thing, probably another one year thing. There is also, from what I've read, this is not my reporting. This is different people that I have read. The name that comes off the top of my head of, of the person that reported this that I can think of right now is... Uh, the mayor, Mayor's Manor, uh, John Hovan from L.A., there is apparently a black jersey in the mix. I've heard absolutely nothing about it, but I've read a lot about it, uh, specifically from him, a couple of other reports around that, uh, possibly a third jersey where it's a, another alternate jersey that they can also wear that's different than the retro reverse. So I think it is possible they wear four jerseys next season, uh, one of which being black. But gold will be the home jersey. And I do believe if the black one comes in, it will probably boot out the gray one. So actually, I'm going to make the prediction pretty strongly. I think there will be four jerseys next year, and it could potentially be a fourth being a swap out of the black for the gray down the road. You're probably going to wear white gold. So white is away. Gold is home. Black or like the, the gray, the current gray is an alternate, which is worn at home from time to time. And then red retro reverse that will be worn a few times. Hopefully they get the fun game. I like that we had the fun game wave pool game at Lake Tahoe. That game sucked, but the idea was cool. So I hope we get a fun game to wear the retro reverse jersey in. I don't see it on the schedule at the moment, but we will see. Uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, interacting on Twitter and, and some of the comments that I saw about some of the uh, questions that I asked today. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm just trying to do what I think is right, which is ask questions that I think needs to be asked. And I felt that the questions that I asked today were exactly what needed to be asked. So uh, that's all I can do. Uh, good night, everybody.